Uh, we want it to be free, free wheeling and open discussion today. And we want to focus uh, principally on business education, um, the changes that are necessary in business education in order to adapt to the future that we we see coming, the future that we're in right now. <clears throat> so um, we're not going to stick strictly to the outline that I submitted to you. Um, and um, we want you to feel free to jump in and share whatever thoughts you have. So I want first I want to introduce everybody. Uh, we have uh, the big new Bokniars, Withold Kinsner, Kinsner. Withold is an engineer, um, professor of engineering in Canada. Uh, big new is a, a professor of economics. We have Lawrence Ford, who's an investor, and uh, John Miller, who is uh, um, a media a former media executive and now an investor, and uh, and I'm a tech entrepreneur. And the focus of today's uh, conference will uh, uh, today's session will be on the uh, challenges and changes that are necessary in business education in order to uh, produce business leaders and tech leaders in particular that are capable of adapting to the existential risks that we have today that we're all facing. And um, but I'm particularly interested in AI, the uh, challenges that AI uh, represents. I'm also interested in um, the need for business education to shift a bit from the science of management to the art of management. What I see in my role as a tech entrepreneur and leader in the tech industry, and also as an educator um, in the uh, in the trade area, is that there's too much emphasis on the science of management and not to not enough emphasis on the art of management. <clears throat> So we graduate people that really aren't capable of adapting to the nuances um, and to uh, uh, making judgment calls based on inadequate information, which we all uh, wish we had more information to make excellent decisions, but we're generally lacking. So we've got to fill it in with judgment and uh, and that judgment is often lacking because it isn't trained at the business school level. So first, I want to introduce John, who's going to be my co-moderator today. John, why don't you make a few introductory comments? Yeah, um, thank you, Walt, and uh, greetings, everyone. Um, taking off on what Walt said, I it, and very much uh, believe that, that, that when it comes to this subject, it is an art and science kind of subject, so it fits very well with the, the mission of WAS in that sense. I also want to uh, use a statement that Walt made at CES, the Large Consumer Electronics Show, where uh, we were, as was, there in force uh, the last two years uh, for the Human Security Project. And one of the things Walt said there that stuck with me, and this is by way of framing uh, the conversation that hopefully we can have today. And by way, what I'll just do is talk for just, just two minutes and, and maybe we could all make some short introductory remarks, then we could have a more open uh, discussion amongst the group. But what Walt said uh, at that time was that the businesses that really tackle and solve um, the major problems and, and issues in the world, such as, such as sustainability, will be the companies that truly prosper in the future. And I think that's that's a profound statement because what it leads to is that this issue um, around sustainability and capitalism is in fact not just a values-based discussion. It is a values-based discussion, but it's also about what works and where value creation will be in the future. So one of the big things that, that I believe, and I know many of us do, is that sustainable capitalism is part of the future for the reasons that businesses exist, which is to prosper and, and do well by their stakeholders. And I think that in order for that to really happen, that there has to be a real tie between the business community and the education community. And so how does that happen? That's one of the things I, 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 I hope we can talk a bit more about today. Um, but I think a couple of things just to, to set the scene again, 
One is, this is really, in my view now, evidence-based. It's not just values-based, it's evidence-based. That there is, there's a lot of evidence out there that companies that do well by their communities, do well by the world, that have sustainable values, prosper um, as enterprises above the norm. And I think that's really important. When it comes to the education side, I think it's very important that this kind of um, education and learning is, is incorporated throughout, for example, a business school curriculum is not in one section that you do for a few weeks of study and then move on to other things. So to me, a big question is how does this, this kind of values and this kind of learning get, get brought into the educational system across the board so that it is really part of the fabric of the education? And then again, how does that get tied? How does that tie directly into businesses and how they understand both their mission and their opportunity? Um, so I think if we could, you know, each again make a couple of uh, opening remarks, and then you know focus on these types of issues, I think we we would uh, have a great panel, and I think we could have a great discussion, and we should we should all be able to to join in and and, and talk to each other's points. So uh, Walt, I don't know which order you want you want to have people go, but perhaps we could all just have a couple of words to say in the beginning, and then we could have a, a, a more open discussion. Okay, uh, Spignan, why don't you start and just uh, give us your perspective uh, about business education and 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 the type of education that technological leaders need today in order to um, uh, prosper now and in the future. Okay, uh, I'm happy to. To join this panel, I am uh, already 56 years in the uh, education sector, so uh, I still love teaching and doing research. <laughs> Just returned from my university, uh, Minnesota, I spent 20 years and um, would like to, to share that uh, preparing a response to your questions, what uh, I consulted with my uh, colleagues who are also teaching, used to teach only in technical colleges, starting uh, with MIT to, to polytechnics in, in uh, Central Eastern Europe. So I got some <laughs> hints from them to, uh, even I used to teach uh, at technical universities, uh, uh, also postgraduate studies. So this is a great opportunity. I believe that, uh, as I mentioned in my uh, uh, conference squad without creative and uh, ethical leaders, uh, business and technology, we cannot resolve facing us problems. And uh, so educating them, this is the basic uh, obligation of academia, all of us. But uh, so talking about ethical uh, leaders, uh, business and technology leaders, we need to build type of sensitivity among them to respond to emerging social and environmental problems. And if we look at the uh, current level of uh, destruction of ecosystem, so uh, I believe as an economist uh, working in this area since uh, 72 that uh, uh, sustainability it's not just enough. We need to move beyond sustainability uh, by creating additional values. Uh, values are restoring the damaged environment. So we need to move uh, uh, step by step to regenerative development. I see this type of development already emerging both in curricula, also in urban areas, you know, creating green areas, uh, restoring uh, destroyed ecosystem is a good direction. So how to do this? What are the basic stuff, the incentives for business? I think that the, uh, despite all these policies we observe uh, so far, they were not effective enough. I think that the concept of creating shared values developed by Harvard professor uh, to work for 18 years with Michael Porter and Mike Kramer, creating shared values is the way to link developing shared values, resolving social and environmental problems, as well at the same time, giving incentives for uh, business and both boards and uh, employees. And then we should think also that uh, 
sustainability is not only the three pillars, the bottom lines, you know, I mean, developed to simplify the notion of sustainability by Ellington, Ellington. But this is, there are four pillars of sustainability. First mentioned in the Earth uh, Charter 2000, then later by environmental science, uh, sciences uh, journal 2005, and finally mentioned in the United Nations document. So that third pillar is cultural or institutional pillar, which should uh, protect the values, values such as democracy, uh, justice, and care. So anyway, uh, we partly see this type of institutionalization of this pillar in, uh, by financial institutions. Uh, which are facing the environmental social threats, you know, the first who respond with ESG. And I think that this is something which we are moving in the direction by uh, popularizing a new business model is the urgent need. And then uh, this is what I, I would like to stop my initial statement. Uh, uh, just uh, one follow-up question. Do you think that our economic models have failed us? that we need new models of economics and new ways of teaching economics? Uh, you, you, we used to say in Minnesota, you betcha. So it means, of course, we need to uh, change economic model from focusing on just on economic issue, but uh, include, I mean, develop I and mean, focusing on social and environmental issue. And in business, we should focus not on just financial, uh, economic objectives, but also on resolving uh, problems. Michael Porter, uh, with Kramer, they said simply, you know, I mean, the business is not just making uh, financial results. This is just uh, resolving social problems with profit. So this is what we need to change model of economic development, move toward uh, not only sustainable in some areas, depends on the country development. But I think that in uh, advanced economies, we need to move to regenerative development, starting restoring the damage system. So I, I want to uh, support this uh, idea. This is not just academia. Recently published in uh, uh, just a few weeks ago, the uh, report of major global investor, uh, investor uh, um, Morgan Stanley, uh, Stanley, sustainable signals shows that 85% uh, of 303 companies uh, over 1 million, over 100 million uh, dollars in three regions, uh, 101 in each, North America, Europe, and uh, Pacific North America, uh, 85 of them regarded sustainability as creation value opportunity. So this is something what is changing already. And we need to move in education toward this uh, uh, movement, not only in business administration, but also in public administration. We need to create type of internal forces within the business and better understanding what business is in about in public sector and in NGOs and build that type of collaborative power, co collaborative coalition for sustainable and regenerative development. Well, hopefully we can get back to this. I think there's some criticism that economics hasn't measured cost accurately or risk mm -hmm. and that uh, it's led us the economics should really be a, a force for good and leading us in the right direction if we if we had the ability to measure more effectively. So perhaps we just need to um, expand our perspective a bit. So yeah. with a lot, I'd like to move over to you and have you comment on on this. You're an educator in engineering, and uh, certainly engineering is is very. Um, 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 very much focused on uh, the mathematics and and the, the 
the scientific aspect of of um of, of the discussion that we're talking about right now not so much on the uh, artistic side of it the art side of it so what do you see and that needs to be done to change engineering education in order to expand people's perspectives and help them understand and deal with more effectively the existential risks that we're facing now. Well, thank you very much for uh, being uh, allowing me to be with you because this is probably one of the most important topics <laughs> for all of us um, is existential. It's not just sustainability. Um, I have, I see that uh, we have changed. The world has changed. Uh, some things in education are still uh, lingering. The Prussian model is still with us. Uh, educating one program fits all. That was good in 1770. It should not be good today. So my approach today will be showing you not only how we might catch up, <laughs> but how it might be even successful through specific things that could be done today, could not be done 10 years ago. Um, the world has changed because in 1950, the time of Russell and others, and us <laughs> when we were young, um, uh, the world had only two and a half billion people. Today, we have more than three times more. Last year, in the middle of November, we reached eight billion. It is not possible to live as we as nothing has happened. So what I would like to show you today is the approach <clears throat> to, to it. So I'll be switching some of the slides in and out. Can you see them? Yes. So my approach over here, uh, perhaps uh, just to give you another example of my the seriousness of my approach is that I was also vice president of educational activities in the largest organization, IEEE it has now 170,000 members. So there is a lot of impact, all of the countries involved, and we have been trying some of the aspects, some of them did not work, but some of them may. So the approach that I would like to see, that I would like us to see as one, no longer a tribal type of um, competition, but a social um, awareness that is connected with the physical world explicitly. And then um, the novelty um, for the last 50 years too, 40 years, is the connectivity through all of the networks. And the networks are also trans, 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 uh, tra uh, changing dramatically. I will show you some of the aspects. I'm leading uh, uh, an initiative that brings satellites, the space communications and terrestrial communications into one so that our education and telepresence could be really uh, achieved. But if we would see it as a, an isolated systems, we are also doomed. We have to really realize that we are interacting and we must be more interacting. And therefore there is a co-evolving, something that cannot be predicted for 10 years or 20 years, but may be predicted within several days or maybe a year. So the horizon of predictability becomes a very important process. But one of the components, since the knowledge tsunami is so so serious, so great, that none of us can learn everything, we need some help. We need digital twins that are cognitive, personalized to us, not to a country, to each individual or at least a group, um, must be cognitive, must be interacting in a way that is mutually beneficial symbiotic and then must include also the history of us not the history of today but the history of all of us prior to it history that i call mimetic so i will show you a few things that we are doing and others are doing in order to implement it obviously without ai it would not be possible but ai not as an artificial intelligence but as augmented intelligence augmented to us, with us, for us. And that's also linked very much with you, Walton and Jonathan, uh, ideas of how the future could be. 
Zbigniew also indicated the four pillars that have to be included over here. All of us are really working towards this. So this is just a glimpse of what, what, will, what I intend to do. And I'm also prepared to, to address those five questions that you, that you uh, showed us. Okay. So for people who aren't familiar with digital twins, could you just uh, give us a very, very brief um, I will do it in, with pictures and are. a diagram. Yes, I, would, I will do it later. But a digital twin is a, um, a digital representation of reality. And reality can be physical, like transportation system, or smart city, or an engine in, on an airplane. Or it could be a living organism, us a digital twin of what we do. But what we do is very simple, but what we think is less simple. How this thinking and doing comes together, how the that specific component leads to creativity. But creativity, as Bigniew mentions, uh, creativity with care, <laughs> care about the others, exactly. care about us. It's not me. But the, the, the four of us sitting over here, yeah. but the four of us is not good enough. <laughs> it has to be the 8 billion people who are suffer because of the rain, because of the poverty, because of the neglect, mm -hmm. because of the, the inability to, to get medication to survive for tomorrow. Um, we can die easily. Living is hard. Digital twins could help us. Second, disinformation and misinformation is so misleading that we are mostly confused <laughs> throughout the day. I need a helper. I can't read everything. I can't check everything. I can't And digi read digital twins can also uh, help on the sustainability issue. Sustainability in well, a big way uh, because, yeah. because the interaction is just too big for us. We are too local too simplistic. Yeah. The, the world has just exceeded our abilities. But the hope is that the digital twins now acquired our language. They speak our language. <laughs> they can communicate no longer by typing or giving us numbers. <laughs> they can talk to us. They don't have I, to I talk. I can see that you're already living in a digital twins future. <laughs> Yes. So you're gonna have I to bring can, us along with I you. Can, I, I can. Your your brain and I, my brain, can be affected today in a positive <laughs> or negative fashion. That's a scary proposition, but I always prepare the good one. <laughs> I believe in people. I believe in you, Jonathan. I believe in you, Zbigniew. Uh, I be believe all of you sitting over here and those who might be listening to us. I think the hope is what matters. But the hope right, is well, care. Uh, thank you. Produces and we'll this. get back to that. Thanks. To the digital twins in a moment. Lawrence, welcome. It's nice to see you again. And thank uh, you. Like your comment on uh, on what you see as the deficiencies and improvements that can be made in uh, in business education uh, in order to produce better leaders. Thanks, Walt. Thanks, John, for having me. And hello, my friends. I'm coming to you from the Virgin Islands today, from little St. John on the front lines of the climate issues that uh, are ahead of us. And interestingly, just uh, two weeks ago, I was at the um, conference for Small Island Developing Nations, where we brought in 38 heads of states from around the globe to address the front lines of the climate issues. And um, the technologies that will either um, lead us out or not in time. So it's a pleasure to be with everybody. And so from an educational point of view, Walt, to answer that question, <clears throat> one of the core things, my work is in the, the world of, for those of you who don't know me, in the world of consciousness and capital. And saying those terms 10 years ago, I was just weird. Now people are thinking I'm just a little strange. <clears throat> and Will said, I, you know, I'm told often halfway through doing my digital twin that nobody needs two of me in the world, but I think that's in jest and I love the work that you're doing. So, uh, you know, what's for me, the biggest thing that we need to do in education today is true. You know, we toss around terms of systemic thinking 
and core systems-based thinking. And to me, that's thrown around with a lot of frivolity as far as I'm concerned. And what really needs to be addressed is, you know, in order to support the understanding that true sustainable development is not possible within the current systems we're operating in. And this was mentioned by a few of, all, of you all already today. And we need to really engage and evolve in new models and new business structures and economic systems that can not only sustain, but thrive for us. And without dealing with these core system issues of the lack of externalities and the extractive, you know, grow at all cost system that we're in today, the rest of the work that we do around solutions tend to be duct tape um, around old system models that will not hold it together. And so the work that, um, there, there's really two areas that I think in education we need to focus on. Uh, and three comments I have around this. Number one is the first is really technology is the future and the leaders and the power in our world today. And when we talk a little bit more about that, we can talk more about the statistics of the amount of uh, you know market cap and returns in general indices that technology itself holds today and where that's going in the future and the concentrated power in the leadership of technology business, which is why it's so critical that we focus in in that world in more of a holistic aspect of education with those folks. What, what would uh, that mean to you specifically, Lawrence? I mean, do you feel like there's, and we need more um, in the way of, of training in ethics, like Nicomedian ethics uh, training? Uh, is there a, a more of an emphasis on the humanities to fill in the gap between uh, the, the data we know and the data we don't know? Um, there's a risk management problem that seems to be happening as well, where we're um, uh, not emphasizing long-term risks adequately. And Ooh. companies, uh, as John mentioned earlier, the companies that are going to survive are the ones that have more of a of an all-encompassing understanding of the risks and manage them more effectively. So what exactly what aspects of business education do you think need to be drilled down on? Yeah, well, all of those are great examples. And candidly, to me, those are current day solutions that are being resolved by leaders in new technologies today, which we, you know, we can dive into. In other words, uh, you know, the lack of understanding um, of externalities have brought us to a tipping point as a humanity of where now we need to, we have the necessity to, uh, to invent new technologies to get us out of this mess we're in. And so I think there's, you know, that's very good business and we're, we're deeply involved in that level of business um, from an investing point of view for new technologies. Um, I think, you know, for the momentum that we're in today with the public entities and the larger corporations, uh, as my friend and a fellow WAS uh, fellow, uh, Frank Dixon, once said to me, um, you know, you tell a washing machine to go fold your laundry, it just won't do it. So there's a lot of, you know, real underlying systemic issues and structures around incentives and lack of measurements, externalities with public companies today that needs to either slowly evolve or candidly be taken over by the new entrepreneurs of the world. Uh, I'm not quite sure where that will end up landing. Um, my, my faith uh, is more in the latter these days than the prior um, because it's tough to, to move a, a freighter uh, while it has a lot of momentum. Uh, but to answer specifically your, your question, Walt, uh, you know, I think we, 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 because we get so rational and left-brained motivated, which are very important aspects of business and science and technologies, we miss the true underlying uh, issue, which tends to be uh, dismissed as simplistic thinking or, uh, or otherwise, which to me is about the essence is that we're all one. And this temporary delusion of separateness as we're alive on this earth is just that. And anything we do from there, from that level of consciousness and thinking, then allows us to come with a mentality that we can just extract and use things for our own personal short-term goods and needs. And so 
in the educational aspect, the understanding from multiple different disciplines of indigenous knowledge, of wisdom keepers from around the globe, I believe that's where it all begins and has that deeply integrated into the education system in schools. I can tell you when I have the pleasure of speaking in business schools and I have a little bit of uh, fun with them, I basically say to the to the kids in graduate school, you know, you don't have to be a jerk to be successful in business, believe it or not. And I get this roaring laugh all the time. And I think it's more of a release because, uh, you know, the system teaches this extractive bullying type of mentality. And then we highlight all so many of the people who have succeeded that way. And so not throwing out the baby with the bath water, the system has done great things and will continue to, but you know, like any system, it needs to evolve and things need to change. And so to me, it's about educating inside the institutions that we need to work on the system while we still work within the system. That's a good point. I'm going to agree with you completely. <laughs> Sean, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, it's, it's a very good point um, about, um, I want to get it right, working on the system while we're in the system, I think is, is the way you put it, Larry. Yeah, and it, and yeah. it's well said. And, and that's one of the things that I said in my opening remarks that um, uh, around evidence-based, because I think there now is more and more evidence that the kinds of sustainable or even regenerative capitalism that we're talking about here has, yields real results. But that's not widely understood in the business community. So I think that it's it's for me a lot of that is two pronged. One is one prong of it is 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 getting that information better understood in the business community, but another is very much teaching it to to, to business school students and, and and students more broadly as they're coming through the educational system, because the and more and more evidence will amass over time. So I think you know it's very important to 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 gain momentum that way, because the other thing I'll I'll, I'll mention to folks that I that I uh, experience. I sit on uh, public comp uh, public company boards and have probably sat on over a dozen over uh, over some years. The pendulum has swung. A few years ago, this in the United States, there was a lot of pressure to embrace things that are typically defined as ESG, right, a a a as the term of art is called inside the public companies. And the pressure now is actually somewhat swung back the other way, where. Uh, publicly, you know, stating goals in these areas can can bring uh, a certain amount of pressure uh, from the outside. So we we also exist in an environment where I think a lot of us on this uh, on, on this group and probably listening share a similar set of values and potentially even approaches. But that is not yet widely adopted uh, throughout uh, the business community, let's say, and the world uh, of business at large. So I think we still have a fair amount of work to do. Let's call it on the ground in that regard and in the educational system to, to really uh, show that the case, in my view, is evidence-based and, and as well as values-based. I agree. And a quick follow-up, if I may, and then I'll hand it off to, to the rest, is, you know, the evidence base is, is key, John, because, you know, we, we have a saying, you know, we, you never have to say you're sorry for doing good. And we base that <laughs> on evidence-based returns and true impact out in the field. And, you know, the problem, which, I was speaking of in Chicago at Morningstar at the beginning of ESG is, you know, watch out. It's a freight train and it's a trend. And whenever you make a religion out of data that in and of itself is not only inadequate, but often data that doesn't want to be shared with the world and then things that actually can't even be measured with impact, you know, you're heading a freight train into a wall. And, and so I think, John, when you speak about how the backlash coming back now, you know, it was a no-win game in that world. And then you have, you know, the greenwashing that went along with it and just took advantage of that, that murky water. Okay. Yeah, I would say that um, good data is not a substitute for, for good character or good judgment. Yeah. And, <laughs> um, and those things uh, tend to come from more of a liberal education. Um, so uh, I think that the whole idea that used to be popular years ago of having engineers, for example, who had a, I remember there was a 3-2 program where people would uh, would go to um, a liberal arts uh, curriculum for three years and then two years of engineering and graduate with two degrees. I don't know how popular that is today, Whittle might know, but I thought that was a really uh, good idea. 
and 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 could uh, help address some of the issues that we've discussed so far. I, I, I don't want to end this session or get too far into it without uh, moving into the topic of AI a little bit, um, because uh, I think that AI is uh, something that's going to put a lot of pressure on business leaders uh, to um, to to um, adapt, and it's going to raise some issues. There's some serious um, uh, threats associated with AI. There's some regulatory. Um, uh, uh, there's a regulatory environment that's developing, that's developing in Europe and uh, here in the United States. Uh, Colorado is the first state to implement uh, AI regulatory environment to try to address the serious risks associated with AI, and and uh, they call them high risk. I'm going to uh, read off what they are: enrollment, employment, lending, government services, healthcare, housing, insurance. Um, uh, legal uh, decision making and critical infrastructure; those are all considered serious um, risks um, in AI. Um, those are going to put a lot of pressure on businesses because now the liability for those um, those utilizing AI in those areas is going to fall upon upon business leaders. And I think many of most of most of most business leaders are not really ready to um, understand it. Then there's the whole question of, of AI bias, which I find isn't very well understood either. So we've got, uh, we're moving into a new technical environment where uh, there's a lot of pressure being put on business leaders to uh, understand this new environment and to make ethical decisions within their companies that comply with the regulatory environment and they're not really very equipped to do that, I don't think. So, what sorts of um, what? How do you see those risks? And uh, maybe digital twins could uh, play a role in in mitigating some of those risks. We'll get to you in a minute about that. But first, I'd like to go to Zvignu and get your take on uh, what you think these how these risks are going to affect business education. These new okay. emerging risks this new regulatory environment, how's that going to affect the way we educate leaders and how's that going to affect uh, economic decision-making? Okay, uh, if uh, I would be able to answer this question, I want to come back for a second, you know, to say, I mean, to the first question I expected we will go through. Uh, if we focus on knowledge gap, gap, you know, uh, with uh, education from technology, we are missing all other elements of shaping human capital. Knowledge, if we, we need, they need to have knowledge besides technical, sophisticated, also the knowledge on environmental science and ecology, uh, circular economy, uh, ethical and uh, corporate social uh, responsibility, green finance, and so on and so on, and, uh, as well as on the risk uh, and opportunities related to AI. But if we do not complement, if we do not move from the model which is still prevailing, I, I, I see, you know, uh, in the States, we are moving in the direction for uh, several, for a couple of years, uh, but in Europe, there's still no uh, uh, education based on knowledge transfer. This is not the right model. We need to uh, focus just from knowledge transfer to build the learning community, student-centered learning community that everybody contributes. And this is something what creates not only the environment students discover knowledge and they treat they as they own. This is very different to, uh, to, to cite opinion of professor or, okay, I learned that, you know, this is my value, I own this. And then creating skills, how to uh, implement this knowledge without skills 
And then the other element, what is important here, you know, you have already mentioned, we need to create the attitude, collaborative attitude, because as you have mentioned, the uh, Vitor precisely meant the changing situation. We need to have interdisciplinary team to resolve it. They need to learn, be open, to collaborate. They need to develop good communication skills and certain values, tolerance to different views, different disciplines, and openness to collaborate, to find joint values. This is something, the basic stuff, you know, we need to forget about that. So another one, we need to think not only about human capital based on these three pillars, knowledge, skills, and attitudes, but also on social capital, building uh, uh, opportunity to collaborate, building relations, participating in the network. This way, we can resolve the issue. And from that point of view, I became a fan of Vital's uh, concept of uh, digital twins since uh, I believe uh, 2018, we attended uh, the uh, um, Global Engineers uh, Conference in Milano, and he presented. Since that time, I think that this is the way we can move in this direction because it is a much more, I mean, more effective system because we individualize the needs, as well as another aspect, using artificial intelligence, we can match the teams, you know, which complement each other. And they could uh, serve much better, more effective, more efficient way, uh, complex and uh, fast changing problems. This is something, the direction, I, I think that uh, Vitold is making the pioneering work in digital twins. And I think that we should think about this in education more, uh, more often and uh, more often applied. So anyway, so this is something what technology gives us, uh, empower us to, uh, to uh, move the direction with better uh, uh, cooperation, uh, we could find uh, more efficient and uh, uh, um, effective solutions. And then so how because, do you feel I mean, that the uh... comments and some uh, and Lawrence also right? Yes, as economists. We are teaching. There were several Nobel Prize uh, uh, winners who were talking about internalization of externalities. In general, in talk, evaluating business, we should focus not on cost benefit, but benefit cost analysis. So the business that should all polluters because house uh, holds polluting too, <laughs> and that should pay for pollution. Period. I mean not. This is not the, the free uh, uh, goods, you know. Anyway, so this is something what I view the uh, technology and I, uh, AI as a better way to communicate, as uh, the way to make uh, uh, sufficient stuff. And then institutions, I, I promise, I am also uh, institutional economist. Economy institutions are changing slowly because good institutions require time. Institutions are in general a product of social capital. We can make good legislation if we trust each other. If we uh, speed up with to regulate something, there is something missing in application. So there is a, a long literature and examples that, uh, I mean, designing institutions is very complex problem. I don't see many universities teaching designing institutions mm -hmm to make sustainable way. And the basic uh, sustainability criteria I learned, I was very fortunate to work with both Nobel Prize winner, uh, Leonid Hurwicz and uh, Elinor Ostrom. You know, the basic principles uh, of uh, institutional sustainability are incentives, period. If we don't have incentives, we will not follow and not obey the rules, you know. The second yeah. is, effectiveness, efficiency, and the third is subsidiarity, decentralization. So anyway, so this is something what we need to be patient in developing uh, joint institutions and uh, start, as Elinor uh, Ostrom said, from below. And this is something moving toward, you know, and then... Uh, yeah, excellent <laughs> points. I couldn't agree with you more. Excellent. And what I, what I might um, add, add um, Walter, uh, 
Fulton, it, it, it's just um, I think that there's a moment in time that we're in now because of technology change that is very, very rapid and all businesses and all institutions are trying to assess their position now in, in light of this kind of change, that there's an opportunity to influence them and, and, and influence the things that, that, that we are talking about here. So I also think there's a very, it's a very important moment in, in which if, we, if, if WAS can play a role in, in, in laying out some guidelines and some other ways that institutions and businesses can, can embrace the kinds of discussions and topics that we're having here, it is a moment when it could be well received or, and, and, and have a real impact. Yeah. We're told, um, I, I, I think I'd like that... you to comment, uh, we're told on how you think AI is going to impact uh, the yes. curriculum. How are we? Uh, how do we need to change the curriculum in order to adapt to a generative AI world? Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I love what just uh, Zbigniew, uh, Jonathan, and Lawrence mentioned, and specifically Lawrence uh, point, uh, mentioned that we are one. I love oneness. <laughs> you know, the four of us, if we would really get together, um, we could really change one eighth of the world. <laughs> <laughs> but if we now multiply it by a billion, eight billion, one acting less one, not the same, but one caring, we could really reverse the tragedies that are coming and are we see today. So it is very hopeful. And without AI, we are just too slow. We are designed to learn something for one job in one lifetime. Uh, that was good in the first industrial revolution and up to 1950. Today, knowledge doubling happens within 12 hours. <laughs> There is no way we can read everything, we can learn. But the care that we have and represent, I think is so powerful that overshadows our limitations. If we could really, in through that oneness that you refer to, Lawrence, we bring it. And now with a tool that has conquered the most sacred part, our thinking, our communication ability, our language, that can communicate with us. It's no longer a dream to have helpers that sometimes are called the digital twins, but our protectors so that we wouldn't go into slavery 4.0. We are being sold now without knowing it. <laughs> uh, that, uh, but the digital twins will know that we are being sold and say no. If the digital twins would say, you know, you are thinking that that's what this says, but it doesn't. Um, and that refers to Jonathan, evidence-based living, not business, but living, living together with the place where is our the pale blue dot <laughs> is our home. We have to take care of it. And with the AI as helper, we could overcome some of the things. In education, however, if it will be done, as you, Walt, mentioned at the beginning, by teaching, <laughs> um, it won't do. We have to move from um, STEM to STEAM. Very often, the A in STEAM is translated into arts. It could be. For me, it is the awareness of oneness. If we, I, I will forget about you, I forgot about the rest. <laughs> we are one, but each and every person is different. If now we'll bring the 8 billion differences together, boy, we are on right. Um, with colleagues, uh, we are trying to bring, I'm leading low earth orbit satellites and systems telecommunications that can do laser laser optical communications in real time terahertz communications in real time we have organized workshops on ai edge computing so bringing ai into space at almost no power smarts and the ability to to do that in my group the cognitive systems group we are looking how that data would be verified also with the help of AI. There are 10 to the 18th bits going on every day. <laughs> there is no way we would have any chance. We are out 
outcast by what is the technology has done to us. But we can collaborate. And then the final point I would like to make that in the old approach, the Prussian model is you learned, had a job, and then retired. <laughs> <laughs> This can no longer, is not sustainable. What about all of the experience that the seasoned professionals have? Why not bringing that specific experience and plowing it into students who are learning and into high school students who are dreaming about something, doing something good? If we would now bring and close the educational loop and bring the experience and the challenges and the disbelief of youngsters, we have now a new way of educating. So it's not just the value, but the value for not only for me, for my family, but for all of us. And yeah. the oneness is the critical component. So if, Walt, if this uh, session would, would leave anything in the minds of others, is the time has come, we have the tools, we have to learn them too. I, I used the tools in my classes, not just to cheat. One of the students say, how would you know that the assignment that I just provided you was, was written by me? I would ask, uh, I would, I, I, my answer was, I would ask Chad GPT who wrote it. <laughs> so <laughs> cheating is not the issue. It is simply uh, the critical thinking and the awareness of what Jonathan mentioned, the value and the revised view of our living for maintaining the planet and also maintaining the systems that have worked very well for a while, at least. It is simply developing it, lifting it to a different level. If we could accomplish a, a part of it, boy, we are on the right way. Thank you. Oh, that's great. That's great. And thanks for all the great comments that are coming in, too. Uh, um, Lawrence, um, how do you think that that education of business leaders needs to change in the in the in the world that we're moving into the generative AI? Thanks for all these comments, by the way, this is beautifully inspiring uh, and I'm, I'm sure everybody else is enjoying it as well. You know, I think back two quick comments on this. One is I remember back when I was probably in college, my dad was a brilliant uh, engineer, scientist. And uh, when uh, we used to call him the uh, the, the pre-Google, you know, we'd say, hey, dad, <laughs> he'd always have the answer instead of, hey, Google. Um, and so, you know, what for me, AI and the whole education, it, we're, we're really moving AI to me, to answer your question holistically throughout all the other questions, Walt, AI to me is just like putting fuel on a fire. It's exponentially moving us in one direction or another. And the direction that we choose to go with AI is up to us and our consciousness as a humanity. And I believe that we are moving to a new revolution of from the knowledge-based revolution, which everybody talked about here, about rehashing, you know, the, the, the traditional education system of learn this and tell me what you learned, um, you know, is, is history. And it's so quickly to learn knowledge and to, to, to your point, you know, you can't even keep up. So please let's get as many twins as possible. Uh, keep me up to speed because every day I get so excited about all the things that I can and can't learn. And so to me, the next generation for us is moving into the, from the knowledge to the wisdom. And okay. the wisdom is really all about our purpose and why are we here on this earth? So individually and collectively, yes, we're one. And then so beautifully, paradoxically, you know, each of our souls is like a snowflake, like no other. And when we <clears throat> express that more, when we are acting who we are more in the world, we have inner peace. When more of us do it, we have world peace. And two positive externalities come from that type of action, I will say quickly. Number one is we can't help but love and appreciate everything that's here to support us because we're experiencing that and we don't need terms like ESG anymore. 
The second is we really have all the answers we need to solve all the problems in the world. And so when you're living, we have to, uh, we're out of time, but I think you, you wrapped it up very nicely for us. And I'm going to let John tie the ribbon on it. I'm going to take off on Lawrence's last point, which was also made by a panelist on the panel before us, which is that we do have the resources and the answers that we need. And, and so to me, it's really about uh, carpe diem, seizing the, seizing the time and the moment to, 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 to make the kinds of changes that we, we know need to, need to be made and to tie these, these systems together between the educational system and the business system to make that a reality. Great. I want to thank all the panelists and uh, all the commenters and everybody uh, for participating. And I, I thought it was a very exciting, excellent panel. Thank you so much. Good.